So if you're new to photography, you might not know where to start with equipment. So let's go over the basics and talk about what you'll need. So the first thing that you'll need is a camera. Uh, there are uh, several different types of cameras that you can use for tabletop photography, but today I really wanna focus and just talk about the two that you're most likely to use. And that would be a DSLR and a camera phone. So a DSLR stands for a digital single lens reflex, which is really just a fancy name for a camera that looks like this. It is the most common type of camera, so you've probably seen them before. It has a detachable lens, so you can swap that out depending on what you're doing. Um, this is my everyday camera. This is my day-to-day -day workhorse camera, and it's what I use in the studio all the time. So the most common question that I get from a beginner when they're looking to purchase their first DSLR is what type of camera should I buy? And unfortunately, there is no single solid answer to that question. Uh, with today's technology being as good as it is, a lot of the top rated, most common brands that you'll find um, all produce a pretty comparable product. So it all depends on what you're comfortable with and what you're used to. The biggest difference that a beginner will probably find between the different um, camera brands is probably in the user interface in the way that the menu is set up and how all of your settings are. So it just depends on what you're comfortable with. Um, personally, I prefer Nikon. This one is a Nikon and it's my personal camera. I started shooting with Nikon when I started my training years ago and I just never had a reason to switch over. And once you start building your camera system, you probably don't want to look at switching brands halfway through uh, because the mounts are different for each brand. So a Nikon lens won't work on a Canon camera and a Canon lens won't work on a Sony camera and so on and so forth. So you wanna pick one brand and stick with it and be consistent. The other thing you wanna keep in mind is don't feel the need to run out and buy the biggest, baddest camera that you can find out there on the market. It is really tempting to always want to go out and buy the shiniest new toy that you can, but the truth is that you probably don't need uh, 50 megapixels and 15 frames per second and burst speed um, if you're just shooting something that's sitting on your tabletop. So having a lot of those extra settings might actually make it a little bit more complicated for you to use and having a larger number of megapixels also translates to a larger file size, which if you don't have a very high processing power on your system, it could bog your computer down and just take up more storage space unnecessarily. So it's not like you're shooting billboards, you're probably using these for Etsy, Instagram, similar platforms like that. So if you're mostly selling online, you really don't need uh, 50 megapixels, to be honest. Now, many people also use their phones to take product photos. Uh, and we'll go over that a little bit more in depth a little later on. So the thing that you wanna keep in mind is you won't have as much control over the image as you would if you're shooting with a DSLR. So you won't have as much control over your camera settings. The camera will probably, the camera phone will probably choose a lot of that for you. And you won't have the capability to swap out the lens like you would with a DSLR. So you're kind of tied to whatever the manufacturer has put in here for you. Now you can buy clip-on attachments and things like that, that will give you a more wide angle effect or a telephoto effect. Um, but it just won't be as high quality as the image that you would get with a DSLR. Now, I will always recommend that you use the highest quality equipment that you can, but if you don't have access to a full camera like this and the phone is all you have, then give it a try and see if it works for what you need. Your phone may very well produce acceptable images for you. So just bear in mind that the best equipment that you can use is what's available to you. So everybody thinks about the camera body first, but just as important as the camera, or in my opinion, arguably more important, is your choice of lens. So if you don't choose the right lens for what you're shooting, it doesn't matter what kind of camera body that you're shooting with, 
it won't end up the way that you intended it. So if you're looking to purchase your first um, DSLR kit, then it will probably come with a pretty standard zoom lens. And that will probably be sufficient for the types of photos that we're talking about today. So when we talk about a lens's range, we are referring to its measurement in millimeters. There are essentially three basic classes of uh, types of lenses. So the first one is a wide angle. This is an example of a wide angle lens. Wide angle is anything that is 35 millimeters and below. So it will, it's pretty self-explanatory. It'll give you a wider um, angle of view than another type of lens will. Next up is a normal, what's considered a normal range lens. Uh, that would be anything that's between a 35 millimeter and a 70 millimeter. So this one in particular is a 50 millimeter lens. Uh, it's considered uh, normal because it will give you the least amount of distortion and it's considered to be the equivalent to what you would see if you were looking at a scene with your eye. The largest type of lens is anything 70 millimeters and above. So this is a telephoto lens. This particular one is 70 to 300. That's probably a little bit more than what you need, but anything 70 millimeters and above is considered a telephoto. Now, if you're photographing really small objects or if you have some tiny details that you can't quite get with one of these three types of lenses, then uh, consider looking into a macro lens. So that will allow you to get very close up, very up close detail shots of a subject, um, especially if it's small, like a small pair of stud earrings or anything like that. One more thing that you can do to increase the capability of a lens that you have. Um, for this example, let's use this lens. So this is my 50 millimeter normal lens. Um, this will this will focus about half a foot away from the subject. But what I can do, say I wanna get in a little bit closer, is I can attach this. This is a close-up filter. This particular set has a set of three. So there's a one, a plus two, and I'm sorry, a plus one, a plus two, and a plus four. So this will allow me to focus a little bit closer. You can just screw this right on the front of your lens. and that will allow me to focus a little bit closer. So previously I could only get about, this lens will focus about half a foot away from the subject, so about that far. But with the close-up filter on, I can get this close. So that's allowing me to capture a lot more detail than I would have been able to get from all the way back here. So if you don't want to purchase a dedicated macro lens, if you don't have one available to you, this is a good option. Another piece of equipment that you might want to consider is a tripod. A tripod will be especially helpful in low light situations. It will help eliminate uh, some camera shake that you might get by hand holding. So, if you're looking at a scene, it might appear bright enough to your eye, uh, but you might be surprised at how dark it is once it's recorded by the camera. So you would need to maybe slow down your shutter speed to compensate for that and brighten up your exposure, but that might create a little bit of camera shake as you're hand holding it. So having your camera on a tripod will help to eliminate that shake and stabilize your scene. What it will also do is help free up your hands. So it's very helpful in tabletop photography so that you're not constantly having to hold the camera, you know, fix your, your scene, find your angle, put the camera down, maybe adjust your lighting or adjust a prop, and then you pick the camera back up and all of a sudden you've lost that perfect angle that you had just a moment ago. So it will help you to have that consistency in your shots. Now let's talk about lighting for a bit. So you don't need any fancy equipment to get good lighting at home. 
If you don't have any dedicated lighting equipment at home, then your best bet is probably to use window light. So a window will give you a pretty large light source that will provide a pretty soft, even light um, that tends to be flattering to most subjects. If you're able to, I would choose a north facing window if you have one of those available to you in your building. If you're shooting with either an east or a west facing window, then you could be at the mercy of the sun and the weather. So a north facing window will give you pretty consistent light throughout the day, if that's an option for you. In the studio, personally, I use one of these lights. This is the bulb right here, and I have a large softbox that will attach to the front of it. So it gives it a large rectangular light source, kind of like a soft, or a, like a window. So it gives me a nice, even diffused light. That, that's what I work with. The one thing that you do want to avoid is using your on-camera flash. I know it's tempting because it's built in and it seems really convenient, but especially when you're photographing a small object, it will produce a very harsh and unnatural light source and it tends to not be very flattering. It will produce also very hard shadows that just don't look flattering to most subjects. Um, that can be a very cool effect if it's intentional, um, but if it's not intentional, it just tends to look kind of mucky. Now, don't be afraid to get creative and experiment with whatever lighting you have around the house. You might be able to use a tabletop lamp that you have at home to get the lighting effect that you need. The only thing you want to be aware of is that different light sources will have different color temperatures. So sometimes you might look at a bedroom lamp and think that it looks a little bit yellow or orange and look at a fluorescent lamp and think that it might look blue or green. That's because those two different light sources are two different color temperatures. So if you have both of them lighting the same image, then half of your image lit by the bedroom lamp could appear yellow or orange, and the other half lit by the fluorescent light would appear blue or green. So your best bet in that situation is to turn one of those off. So you just want to avoid mixing your color temperatures as much as possible. Light modifiers is a pretty self-explanatory term. It's anything that's going to modify the light that's coming from your light source. So for example, uh, you saw the, the light head a moment ago that I typically use in the studio. I like to put a softbox on that and that helps to diffuse and soften the light. So it is considered a light modifier. Um, but the type that I use the most often is just a simple reflector. So here's an example of one that I use all the time. This is a small one, so it's a great size for tabletop and product photography. And this particular one is also reversible. So I have a few different color options in here that I can choose from that will give me a different effect, whether I want a softer reflection or uh, maybe a little something a little bit brighter. I can also remove this from it. So this is called a scrim. So I can hold this up to my light source if I need to and get an extra level of diffusion. So it will soften and diffuse the light and make it nice and flattering on my subject. Now another thing you can use as a reflector if you don't have something like this available is just a simple piece of poster board or foam core. I actually really like to use this a lot, especially for tabletop photography, because it's very easy to cut and customize the size. And honestly, it's okay if it gets a little bit dinged up because that's going to happen. But this is really easy to prop up just off screen, just like that. You can also use uh, things like uh, a mirror if you want a harsh highlight or a piece of aluminum foil, anything like that. So the last thing that you're gonna see me use a little bit later on is called a light tent. So a light tent is essentially a large white box. All of the sides are white and it has one major light source, one main light source, and all of the white areas of the box will allow the light to really wrap around your subject It'll soften it and it'll diffuse it and give a nice even lighting. So this is good if you're shooting on a, a white seamless backdrop and you just need a simple straightforward photo of your product. Props and backgrounds are always a lot of fun to play with. And again, you don't need anything too fancy here. 
For backgrounds, I often use uh, paper rolls and scrap of paper. I'm a big fan of scrap of paper. So I use a lot of bright, bold, solid colors um, just because that's kind of our image here. But use whatever works for you. Um, just you might be looking for a more neutral toned color, something a little bit softer, like maybe this pink would be a little bit too much for you. You might want to go in more like the tan or grige color family. Um, try to stay away from bold patterns or prints that are going to draw a lot of attention away from your subject. So you want to keep the focus on what you're photographing. So say you have something like this, as pretty as it is, it doesn't make a great background because it's so busy and it draws so much of your visual attention away from your jewelry. So if you really want to use something like this, I would maybe hide a good portion of it with the yellow and only keep a little bit of it in the corner of the frame. Or maybe you just want to bring in a corner and just have it as a little accent piece in your image. Now with props, again, you want to keep it simple. Don't overthink it. I like to use a lot of little pieces of tile. Uh, you can get them in all sorts of colors, textures, shapes, and sizes. And you can get those at Home Depot, any home supply store like that. So here's one of my favorite props. This is just a set of marble tile coasters, but they're good for anything. If you put a piece of jewelry down on it, it looks really nice. It works with a lot of different color tones, things like that. I also like to use a lot of plants. This is a fake succulent, but it's really cute if you just need to add a little bit of color to an image. And you can always use real plants too if you have that available to you. Same thing with food. It's always fun to throw in the background. And gemstones. Something like this is nice if you just need to add a little pop of color to an image. So if you're looking at your image and it doesn't quite look right, if you feel like your props aren't adding anything to the image, just take them out. Don't overthink it. You want to keep it simple and just make sure that the focus stays on your subject. Even more important than what type of camera body you choose to use or what brand it is or how many megapixels it has is that you understand how to use the settings on your camera. It's really tempting to take your shiny new toy out of the box and start shooting away immediately, but if you don't familiarize yourself with at least the basic settings, then a lot of those controls will go underutilized and you won't have as much creative control over your final image. So I'll try to stick to the basics here because quite honestly, this could be an entire course on its own. But the three main settings that you really want to familiarize yourself with first are the three that will control your exposure. So shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. So your shutter speed is how long the shutter in the camera body is open for. The aperture is how large the opening in the lens is. The ISO, without getting into too much technical detail, think of it as a measure of how sensitive your camera's sensor is to light. So if your ISO is higher, then your sensor will be more sensitive and you will have a brighter exposure. Now, as you increase your ISO, it will also increase the amount of grain or noise that you see in your image. So for this reason, this is the last setting that you want to increase if you're trying to brighten up your exposure. In addition to controlling how much light is let into the lens, the shutter will also control the amount of motion that's captured. So for example, if you're photographing a hockey game and there's a player in motion, you'll want to use a faster shutter speed to freeze that player in motion. If you use a slower shutter speed, then it will create that motion and the player will appear blurry. The aperture will also control the depth of field of an image. So the larger the aperture, the smaller the depth of field. If you've ever seen a photograph where the subject is in focus and the background is very blurry and out of focus, that's because the photographer chose to use a shallow depth of field. So the larger the aperture, the more shallow the depth of field and the more light that is let into the lens, which creates a brighter exposure. The smaller the aperture, the greater the depth of field. So your background will be more in focus, but you will have a darker exposure 
So the other thing that you want to keep in mind, aside from your exposure, when you're setting your basic camera settings, is to use the highest quality image output um, that you can. There's typically a high, a medium, and a low setting. Keep it on high whenever possible. Uh, the reason behind that is if you need to shrink your image, if you need a smaller size for any reason, it's a lot easier to shrink the size of a large image than it is to scale up or enlarge the size of a small image. So it's easier to go down than it is to go up in size. I know it feels like a lot to learn and it's a lot to absorb all at once, but I promise it's worth the time and the effort that you put in, in the end. The more creative or the more technical control you have over your camera settings, the more creative control you have over the final output. If you feel a little bit overwhelmed, just try to take it one step at a time and try to learn something new every time you pick up your camera.